sit back in your seats, get something to eat, and watch this movie. Don't let the kids see it, because, well, let, let, we'll let you hear the, the, the um, video. Thank you. Alright, this week on Left of Projector, we are doing our first ever double feature. And we are going to be talking about the 2013 and 2014 franchise, The Purge. First being The Purge 2013, and then The Purge Anarchy in 2014. Both were directed by James DeMonico, and both were pretty big in the box office. Uh, pretty low-budget movies, all things considered, just three and nine million each each netting over a hundred million in the box office. So fairly popular films and both people who are my guests today have recommended and suggested these movies both recently and a while ago. So finally glad to cover them. So this week on the show, I have Molly McAleer and I have Don Gilroy. Thank you both for joining us. Oh, today. you're so close. <laughs> Did I screw it up? It's okay. Look, Molly, it's you went Gilroy, over two. Right? <laughs> <laughs> what did, did I say Gilroy? Yeah. I did, you know what's funny is that's the most common mispronunciation. And so as soon as you said I was like, ah, I knew it. Well, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna redo it because that's uh, the power No of, uh, man, leave that in. Leave that's right. that's part of that's fun. <laughs> like <laughs> Yeah, I guess that's true. But I don't know, so so I guess uh, for anyone who had listened to an older episode, Molly and I talked about Ferris Bueller's Day Off, and I think whether it was either during the episode or at some point you mentioned or asked if I'd seen the purge and I hadn't seen them, and it took me until about three or four weeks ago when Don suggested doing them uh, for an episode and I've watched now the first two multiple times I've watched the third and fourth and I was actually very surprised about how much I enjoyed these and so I don't know and Molly you're both you're a big fan you're both big fans so I don't know maybe tell me what what's uh great about the purge I'm glad Don's here I'll say that because I'm not always so elo eloquent about the purge I it just makes me so excited that my words sort of are limited about it but there's something so thrilling about it and maybe similarly to like the squid games where or squid game where you're just watching chaos and you can't help but think what you would be doing in that situation and then what if you were doing what you wanted to be doing probably staying at home right and then you got infiltrated and how scary that would be. But then there's also a part of me that thinks about, gosh, you know, when you were 25 or, or, or 20 or 18, would you have been stupid enough to go out there and have tried to get involved? It just makes it makes me think more than a lot of average horror movies. And the concept is, you know, I, I don't think we should have a purge, but it feels like we're getting kind of close to it. I couldn't help but laugh when I was rewatching the first purge at the fact that it was supposed to be happening in 2022. It just felt like, <laughs> yeah. you know, that like at the time it was like the worst possible thing. It's like a reverse the Jetsons where they came up with so much um, magical, amazing stuff that we might be able to do in the future and with the purge, like we're getting kind of close, but the idea that they thought that maybe 2022, that was their projection. It, yeah, there was just something very thrilling about it. So I'm super psyched to talk to you guys. As I'm what about you, Don? I, uh, wh while Molly was talking, a couple of quotes, like she just immediately made me think of, uh, of a couple of quotes or a couple of issues. One being a quote, um, where, Jean-Luc Picard in, in Star Trek, The Next Generation, I'm uh, sorry, one of the films um, that was First Contact, where he makes the comment about, you know, you can't really be, we can't consider ourselves civilized until our humanity catches up with our technology. And when Molly was talking about, you've got all this great stuff, it's the anti-Jetsons, you got all this great stuff, but everybody's just killing each other. And you just see how really bad ideas are accepted as good ones because people are, people are not thinking about the outcome. People are not thinking about the effects of of, uh, of any of those actions. Uh, and the other was, uh, I think the same production, I think it's Blumhouse that's doing this as well, which is Civil War. They released, I guess, the trailer around Thanksgiving or December or something. And I saw it and my immediate thought was, 
anybody who is excited at the premise of this movie is troublesome because <laughs> when I first heard of, of the purge and, and I've got the same feeling I had when the purge was announced, I'm sorry, the purge film was announced. Um, <laughs> he got me scared was, for a second. I was teaching high school. It was the last year I was, I was there because I was just, I was done. Um, and one of my students came to me and she said, Oh, Mr. G, there's this new movie coming out where crime is legal for 12 hours a day. That's so great. Could you imagine if we did that in the real world? And I looked at her without any like hesitation. That's the stupidest idea I've ever heard of in my life. <laughs> She's like, and she was like so excited at the concept. And I looked at her and it's like, so you mean to tell me you'd be comfortable living in a world where anybody and everybody can commit crimes. That is very bad. I mean, cr commit crimes with impunity. Like, think about what what what's the day after that going to look like? <laughs> it's funny that you say it's, that. It's, it's a cycle. I have heard people who I would call maybe, I mean, in your case, it's a student, but I've heard people that sort of, I would maybe describe as simplistic thinkers, be like, the purge mm -hmm. isn't the worst idea that I've ever heard of. And it's like, well, you're not thinking about what that would really look like. You're mm -hmm. thinking of how fun it would be to hit up a convenience store and rob it or how fun it would be to, you know, go do a bunch of illegal drugs or whatever. You're not thinking of the people who really honestly own weapons in this country and what they would do with it. And now we're in just such a place of how long ago were you teaching? Uh, I was teaching, oh gosh, that was 2013 when I left. And then I went to Arizona State. I was there for about nine years. I mean, in 2013, I don't think anyone could have fathomed truthfully that we'd be exactly where we are with the political landscape. Maybe, yeah, some bigger picture thinkers could, but I don't think your average American citizen thought that we would be in the place that we are. No. I don't know. Some of them were looking forward to it because, uh, Molly, I don't know your age, but uh, and, and Evan, I don't know yours, but I was around in the 90s when like that right wing surge was taking place where um, you had Waco, you had Ruby Ridge and, uh, and you had all these hate groups that started popping up or at least making themselves known. Uh, and it was very scary as far as like, you know, we had people bombing abortion clinics in, in the 90s and it was it, it, I mean, and then, of course, you look back further in time, you think about things like the 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 80s or just the the 60s as far as the violence uh, enacted upon civil rights activists. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and I, I just turned 40 and admittedly, I lived a very um, sheltered, privileged white girl life uh, for the most part of my life. So you're right. I mean, like, yeah, that's difficult to. Yeah. I mean, taking all that into account. You're right. We shouldn't purge. Well, 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 no, no, no. But look at it this way, Bali. You're recognizing like where you are, right? So within the films, you know, the, the first one, it's it's a home invasion horror film. The second one, it it's a it's a survival horror film. Um, you see that perspective of a, you know, upper middle class, if not upper class white family, you know, a, the nuclear family, the the Norman Rockwell type family, if we had thrown this back another 50 years, they've got everything that's going for them. And they've been able to benefit from this system. They've been able to do all these great things. They're not thinking about all the people that can't afford those security systems. They're not thinking about all the people that are going to be, you know, that are going to be unhoused or um, the, the destitute or anyone who is, you know, happens to be I don't know, struggling with addiction and they just happen to go outside that day. Like people who are non-participants in this, but they're safe there, right? And then you have the the survival portion of the of the second one where you get to see a working class family and you don't really understand, you know, what the what the the I always forget the couple's name, but I was <laughs> I don't know where they fit in as far as socioeconomic Seth. class, but they understand the purge is bad. Yes, Seth. Oh no, Shane was his name. I knew it was one of those. Yeah, names. Shane and Liz, I think, right? Yeah, when she's like, yes. she just goes Shane, and I'm like, oh, that's one of those names. 
<laughs> <Okay. laughs> <laughs> that just always that was, sounds uh, difficult coming out of a person's mouth like that. Anyway, sorry. <laughs> sorry to interrupt. Unless it's a Western. Unless it's a Western, then it's, it's okay. <laughs> but then the Westerns, Westerns have their own issues. Uh, but no, it, it, you get to see how this mother-daughter team are explaining how the purge works. And they're like, this is what it's like for us. Like nobody's, you know, grandpa went and sold himself to this white family so they could kill him so that they, his, you know, his daughter and granddaughter could have a better economic situation. So they could actually buy a home or move out of where they were. The idea that he's willing to participate in the system as a victim how all these people get taken advantage of, the way in which they all get exploited. To I, I looked at the statistic that was offered in this film, or in the second film, where they say, you know, the year is 2023. Uh, unemployment is below 5%. Crime is low. It's all thanks to the purge. And looking at this with my eyes from 2014, when I saw this in the theater, like I've seen every purge movie in the movie. I, do not, I did not miss them. <laughs> but saw it in the movie theater opening night and the eyes that I have in a post-COVID, post-Trump world, well, I'm still not post-Trump, but post-Trump <laughs> presidency world, um, you start to look at the purge a different way as well because you think about where you were as far as your your socioeconomic background, your, uh, your, your racial or marginalized group that you may belong to, uh, people with an LGBTQ plus IA organization. Why did I say plus IA? IA plus uh, <laughs> spectrum as far as like understanding the way in which those groups that have been typically marginalized or traditionally marginalized, how the purge was taking place for them for, for this entire time, just in different ways. Mm. Um, before I run on too much and give Molly a chance. Like here in, in, in Jackson, Mississippi, there are two things that have taken place in recent years. Um One, the discovery of what started off as 200, but now it's in the hundreds of of unnamed bodies that are outside of the the jail. Uh, And then there was the water crisis. Sorry, water crisis. So anybody who's watching this, not listening, I'm sorry, listening, but not watching, I'm doing air quotes. The water crisis. Uh, and And I do that with the air quotes because why are we having a crisis to get water to clean drinking water? Um. And the issue is that water, that water system was working for a predominantly black and poor city. Yeah. Um, I forgot what the the poverty rate is in Jackson, but I know last time there was a census done, Jackson itself was around 81, 82 percent black. Uh, and when you live in a state that is that enjoys talking about its history with the Confederacy with without talking about all the other stuff. Um, it becomes really clear that if you're poor, if you're a poor person of color, and if you're a poor person of color in the South, purge days for you every day. It's just it's just going to manifest in a different way. Well, to your point about sort of like the realization, I don't know. I think in both films it was really nice how they had realizations where the first family had this realization that it wasn't just about them protecting themselves when they were really surprised that people were being brought in from bad neighborhoods. People who had, you know, were experiencing homelessness or drug addiction were being brought in to be killed by the people who wanted to purge in privacy. And then also the moment in the second film where the mom explains to her daughter, like, no, like rich people will buy people, you know, your grandfather right. went and, essentially sold himself to these people so that they could purge in privacy. It's um, yeah, it's uh, I thought that was sort of compelling when I was watching. I was like, Oh, okay. That's nice to watch them back to back is a different experience. Molly, something you brought up just now. Um, I, I, I thought about it when I rewatched it earlier today and you just reminded me of that. When that family has, you know, pop, when they've got him there, the weapon choice is very interesting because they all have machetes, which, you know, if you go through history and take a think about the, the, the power structure as far as the way that machetes are used uh, by, by marginalized uh, communities of color against uh, white slaveholders, uh, white, white imperialists, things like that in the, in the Caribbean, as well as the American South. It's an interesting flip that 
you've got basically a sold into slavery contract or so, sold into sacrifice contract. I'm selling myself as a black person to a white family, a rich white family. They are going to use a tool against me that I may have had, as far as my ancestors, had to use to cut uh, sugar cane or rice cultivation, anything like that. But it would also be used as a weapon. So it goes from being used as a tool to a weapon that I could use against the person that's keeping me enslaved. But now we've got this flip of you're using this weapon that has so much history within America, as well as other nations. But uh, within the American chattel slavery system, you are now going to use it against me. Not only that, a machete is... It's a hacking weapon. It's not for precision. It's to make somebody suffer. It's it's something that you want to, at least for this family, it's like they want to have that full experience of chopping somebody to death as opposed to you have a gun, you have a knife, and you may just stab them in the heart uh, or you might cut their throat. This is something, it is a messy type of scene. And I'm glad that, at least where we were with films in 2013 to 2014, we weren't in the wild west of the early 2000s, like, you know, movies like Hostel and whatever, where it was just torture porn. So I'm glad that they didn't go that route with this with this scene. It's just implied this is what's going to happen. You can envision what's going to happen because they have the plastic all around that room to let you know it's going to be a mess. I think one of the this brings up a good point, maybe for for both movies and just kind of like the concept of the purge in general, where primarily it's wealthy people. I think you said, Ma, like who has the guns primarily in society, you know, people who are conservative, maybe people who are wealthy too can, can hoard guns. And they've now are preying on poor writ, poor, you know, people of color, working class, whoever it is in, in the two different movies, it's different groups, but they're, they're very, very rich which is not the people who are like attacking the family, the the Sanders family in the first movie. They're like rich, but they're not like I wouldn't necessarily make they make them out to be True. the wealthy family in the second movie where they're selling them right. out. I guess my point is is that the rich people in this franchise are they want to commit violence, but they want to do it like in the privacy of their own home. Whereas right. you think about the violence committed by the system is something that everyone is openly is able to see. So it's almost like they're bringing the violence to themselves so they can, you know, do it as this little ritual, you know, they put their hands in the little circle and they praise their, you know, the new, the new founding fathers. It's very much this religious puritanical kind of weird, creepy ritual that they, they don't just go in and start cutting them. They have to make it a process. Um, I don't know. The first movie no, is I, definitely I, I, oh, new oh, money. Yeah, I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. It's okay, Don. The first movie is definitely new money, and the second yes, movie yes. is definitely old money. Yeah, I was going to say that um, at least in the the opening of this film, the second film, I'm sorry, there's a narration that says, you know, America prays to the altar of, of Smith and Wesson. And so I just wrote down, it's like America's true religion is death and dollars, um, it, because it's another film that talks about the exploitation, or at least has a moment of exploitation of, of, of the working class is... Uh, Cinderella Man, where James Braddock, uh, portrayed by, oh my God, <laughs> Russell Crowe, uh, portrayed by Russell Crowe, he's given this speech to these, these promoters and says, Hey, I got my pride, you know, after they tell him, like, you could kill, get killed in the ring. We can't sponsor this. This would be really bad, blah, blah, blah. Says there are people dying on docks on the street every day. There are people dying in, in these, in these Hoovervilles said the only problem is you guys haven't figured out a way to make money off of it. And that was what was sitting in the back of my mind was how can somebody make money off of X? And that's when you get to determine whether it's exploitation or if it's productive. Whereas let's just say, you know, I'll be, I'll self-promote here. So I've got a book and I go ahead and say, this book is going to cost you X amount of dollars. I wrote it. I produced it. You know, I got the resources to put all this together. Whereas if I did go another route and I say, I don't know, I'm going to use AI to create the next bestseller. I'm exploiting other people's work and stealing other people's property, intellectual property in order to do that. 
that's how, I mean, there are people who are doing that. But anyway, when it comes to this, you see how insurance companies are involved. Uh, healthcare is involved. Gun companies, obviously. Uh, you have Security. protection. Yes. You have all these institutions in which you could do this or make this happen, but make money off of it. It would be completely different if it said, hey, we're going to give you guys a day, go off in the woods. We don't give a damn if like 10 of you come back out of 100. Great. Then it's, you know, I don't know. It, it becomes an issue of it was two groups, two warring factions, two groups that did not like each other. I'm not selling them anything. I'm not giving them anything. Nobody else is. You guys handle this yourself. Go fight. Whatever. Uh, is completely different than I'm going to see how, not just how much money, how much money I can get away with making off of this and how many people I can exploit to the point where I'm going to be making money for life off of it. And that's all I see is just this reproduction, this this cycle that keeps going on, going and going and going. Um, because even in the third one, uh, Michael T. Williamson's character makes a comment that he's going to stay in the store because he can't afford the insurance, the purge insurance, because it's special insurance. Yes. And you then you think about all the people that are put in harm's way because they can't avoid the purge. And this is a great way to even explain something like capitalism. You can't afford <laughs> to fight against the system. You can't afford to work within the system. So you end up being exploited by the system without your consent. But I love these movies. So <laughs> I love good. talking about these also, movies. Also, Don, you probably know this, but you're so smart. I'm like, really, I've loved no. I've loved the thoughts that you've had so far. And yeah, I really admire your approach to these movies. No, no, no. This is conversation that we are all having. It is productive conversation. Each part is essential to have a conversation. Thank you. So <laughs> I will take the compliment, but I'm going to say this this is a group effort. Well, let, let me let me bring in briefly like a little bit about the first movie that I think it for maybe anyone who hasn't seen it just as a a bit. Obviously, we've talked about what the purge is, but the the main protagonist of the of the or the two I guess main characters in the first movie are played by um, Lena Headey and Ethan Hawke, and they're essentially you know wealthy you know suburban uh family and they have two kids you know uh, I guess like a seventeen year old daughter and maybe a twelve year old son. And the thing that that you talked about made me think about bringing this in just to talk about that was is you talked about the the who's making profit off this. And Ethan Hawke's character is a salesman for one of these security systems, primarily for like the rich suburbs where they can have, you know, fancy metal gates on all their doors and cameras and everything. And he's bragging. He's very excited to brag about how he's like the top salesman of the year. And I think maybe you, Molly, said how eventually they come to the realization that maybe it wasn't worth all of the things that they've done, you know, to off the backs of all the people. And, you know, the, you know, the, he's he even made, basically mentioned at one point that 10 years ago they couldn't pay their rent. And now he's looking right. at buying a sailboat. Like, it's very clear that this family, you said, Molly, that's new money, very obvious that they've made a fortune off of the purge. They've succeeded and they've now are exploiting the people that they are now housing briefly in their home because their son has the empathetic spirit or soul to open the security system, you know, bring someone in who's being hunted. And then the rest of the movie, as you said, is a home invasion. Basically, the the people who want to kill this black man are just trying to get into the house and eventually, you know, shit pops off, you know, near the near the last third of the movie. And so I think it's important to uh, just to kind of sketch that out. And oh, yeah, yeah, I think it's uh there's lots of layers. The thing that I like about both movies is in both situations of the apartment you see later in the second movie where they all kind of regroup and also in the house, there's always someone you don't expect that's going to want to purge. In the first movie, the, the 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 daughter's boyfriend wants to kill the father, Ethan Hawke. And then in the second movie, you have one of the wives wanting to kill another wife and her and her uh, her husband for cheating on them with her sister. So there's always these like messy things. And, you know, those might be I don't want to say reasonable, but somewhat they're conflicts that are now resolved at vi with violence because. Right. They're legally allowed to do they're so. They're crimes of passion. I'm not exactly sure where I'm going with this. No, they're crimes of passion. I was actually thinking about this, Evan, because I was like, well, I'm sure I'm going to have to answer to my own purging instincts when I'm on the podcast. And <laughs> just <laughs> thinking to myself, like, would you, when would you, if you had to purge? And truthfully, 
I really think I'd like I'd be like the drunk lady at the second apartment in the second movie where if I probably am my most irrational at my youngest at my most unconscious, I would probably kill an ex-boyfriend. And (laughs) that's not okay. But it was it was I was thinking to myself, if you had to purge someone who would it be? And it would be a crime of passion type thing. And and um, also we see with the main character in the second movie, the sergeant, like that he went for the exact same, he went for the exact same reasons, which is like, you harmed me, you harmed someone I loved. Like I, I've been waiting for this motherfucker. Like <laughs> that's like sort of the um, element of the purge that I find to be really like, gripping is that it would be an opportunity that I think so many of us have had or the thoughts that we've had where it's like, I really could go like, I could go right now if you told me. And um, the idea mm. of all of that stuff happening in one night is it's neat and tidy. I, I, I've made a post before coming on and I put, so I'm, I'm rewatching the purge series and it is very evident that um, at least the, 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 the meaning behind this is America will do anything other than aside from going to therapy. Just we will come up with any solution other than going to therapy. It's like, oh, I feel bad. Let me grab gun. I shoot people. Now I feel good. Wait, no, I don't feel good. Wait, purge is next year. I'll go again. And it, it's I I don't know if I would participate. Um my my friend James, who co-hosts the uh that I co-host uh the Necronomy.com with or Necronomy.com with um he always says when this comes up when we've done this film on on our show is no he doesn't want to participate because he's gonna die really really soon really early because you know he'll make a self-deprecating joke about his weight or anything like that he's like i'm not gonna make it and my question was always prior to the latest film you know what happens to people who can't take care of themselves and there are people that that you know get centers and they and they negotiate spaces that are off limits. So I think if the purge were to take place, I would hope that I would be one of those people who says, Hey, I will, I will stand guard and on the, on top of the building and help you guys make sure that all these people are safe. Um, Because when the first couple of films came out, I seriously thought about like, what would I do? Where would I go? What would I, as opposed to, is this really something I should do? And you see that happen in both of these films with people who regret their actions because even even the mother and father or i should say the mother in the first film lena Headey's character uh, mary um she doesn't want to she she can fully go ahead and take revenge out on anybody that she wants to at this point and as an audience you would say it's it's granted but you see how she does not like the purge or at least she realized the purge isn't what it all all what it meant excuse me all that it was meant to be because when those other folks are in her house, like she doesn't kill them. Even even when they try to kill her, her response is no more killing. We were not going to kill anybody, anybody else tonight. It's over. Yeah, I love I kind of loved that choice. Um, wow. Like a couple of thoughts on that. Like, I loved that choice. I loved that she shoved that woman's face into the table. That was so appropriate. It was so necessary. Mm-hmm. It needed. To, if you're going to do something, that's exactly what you should do. Is it wrong to say that at the end of the second film, when the or the first film, when the homeless guy <laughs> was released, that I was sad that they didn't make a plan to keep in touch? Right. <laughs> Is that awful? I'm like, you guys have been through all this together and y'all aren't going to keep in touch. Like, I've fallen more in love with people at a bar in Vegas. You know what I mean? I would owe that guy my life. Mm. I'd be like, come here every Friday. We're going to have dinner for you. I, I feel like the purge would be very bonding in some ways if you lived through a purge with someone. Yeah. And I don't even think it got covered, but. Because even in the credits, he's referred to as Bloody Stranger. And then in the second film, he's just Stranger. He's never given a name. There's not even a, you know, thanks, kid. And it's like, oh, what's your name? I'm Mike. Thanks, Mike. You know, there's not even that moment. <laughs> but it, it almost lets you know how how overlooked because, you know, he's he's it's stated that he's uh, homeless. Right. Um, but 
you see their dog tags and and me watching this, I'm like, oh my God, a, a homeless veteran. How ironic that rich people are hunting down a homeless veteran to dispose of. And don't even refer to him, don't even have a name for him. They refer to him as a dirty homeless pig. While we are fine, young, and educated, we are people just like you. Um, he doesn't know his place, and we don't want to kill our own. You know, I mean, just paraphrasing some of the stuff this, the guy says, but showing that there is this understood idea that whether it's racial, whether it's ca uh, caste, because I can't even say class with this, if it's caste, but there's this understanding that these people don't deserve to live. They're only on this earth to serve us and for us to sacrifice. And I mean, it it, it hit home, I, I guess, about the, the after I watched all the films and rewatched that, you realize how how much they minimize and how much they erase uh, marginalized people in the first film and then how much they elevate them in the second film, whether that was intentional or not, or if it was just like, hey, we're going to tell this perspective. But the way they do it, they're able to capture that anxiety um, that, you know, a group that the stranger would have come from as far as what he was dealing with. And, you know, you see that he decides the purge is not a night I'm going to let anybody else get exploited. Well, real quick, I mean, just in terms of like box office numbers and everything, I wouldn't doubt that they did have a second purge in mind or hope for it. Mm -hmm. But I feel like people would be less inclined to come out for a movie that's more openly about the struggle of the working class than it is. Oh, my gosh, these rich white people are, are going to get terrorized. And I feel like in a way, like the other purges could not have happened if they hadn't focused mm. on this situation in the first one. And then by the time we get to the fourth purge, where we find out what it all, you know, really sprang from, which was racism, right. which was about eliminating the lower class, which was about eliminating specifically black people who lived in the projects, mm -hmm. it it's it's obvious that they had to build to that, in my opinion, because I don't know that the average American would have been as concerned with the plight or would have come oh, yeah, out most definitely. if it was more like, oh, we're worried about people in the inner cities. It's the the idea of your suburb like suburbia being terrorized that is right. profitable at first. Yeah. And I wrote in my note, I was like, you know, uh, and I'm glad you brought that up because I wrote down. The fact that the purge was only a problem when it impacted them. Um, horrible sentence, but that's what I wrote. You know, it's, it's only a problem when it when it impacts them. You know, they they're not worried because they have the security system. They got all this stuff in that house to make sure that they're safe. And that's the same thing. I'm glad. You know, again, if it were released now, it, the 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 commentary or the complaints would be, oh my gosh, this woke movie. I mean, as far as like the purge anarchy were released. Uh, as the first film uh, in a series. You're right. Um, the general public either wouldn't get it or you would have people running around talking about how woke it is. It, it's also, at this time, like 2013, I think about horror movies at that time. It was kind of, it wasn't maybe, it was kind of before kind of this newer golden era of a lot more horror movies. And at that time, it wasn't, um, what was I thinking about this? It wasn't... Uh, now it's more popular for horror movies and movies in general to kind of degrade rich people. Mm. You think of like the, uh, like Glass Onion and the one before it and the menu and these kind of movies where it's right. making fun of the fun of rich people. Whereas in this movie coming out, I think well before that era, having it be kind of degrading rich people and showing kind of their power over this and what they can do and the reason that they like the purge. Also is why it had to be the first one too. Again, I think mm -hmm. it. There's no way you could have started it, as you said, Molly, from the second one. You have to have this first one, and then it just kind of flips it on its head by saying, "Now we're going to show the perspective of the people who are actually affected, right. beyond just a random guy who gets dragged into it because the rich people are hunting him down." So I think it's a they they made a good choice, and I was just trying to see when they decided to make the second one. It seems like right after oh, it was instant, it was it successful. Was, yeah. yeah. As soon as this first one came out, it was successful. They they said, like, go for number two. I mean, maybe he had the idea of what the whole kind of sketch would be 
I couldn't find anything from um, James DeMonico about that. I do know that the reason he thought of the idea for the purge supposedly was his family was almost hit by a drunk driver. Um, Mm -hmm. And they're like thinking like, Oh, I wish I could kill that person for, for doing this. And I don't buy that story. And I'm going to (laughs) throw in something that this is, this is my theory on why he created this movie. And it's only because after I watched these two movies, this is completely random. I watched an old Alfred Hitchcock movie called rope with James Stewart and the have you seen that, that movie? It's one of it's my I, probably my favorite Hitchcock movie outside of Strangers on a Train. It's so gay too. It, it, oh yes, <laughs> I mean yes. The John John Dell and Farley Granger should have been like kissing by the by. But that's separate. But the whole point of the movie is <laughs> it. The, the point of the movie for anyone who hasn't seen it, I won't ruin it because the movie starts with two men strangling their friend with a rope, you know, hence the title. They throw him into a trunk and the guy, the main character is saying, I'm so cocky about this murder. I'm going to throw a dinner party at my apartment to flaunt it over everyone. And he invites the character who played by James Stewart and James Stewart and him have this conversation basically saying that they believe that rich people and people of higher class have the moral authority to kill people of lower classes because of their station in life. Now, you don't really approve of murder, Rupert, if I may. You may, and I do. Think of the problems it would solve. Unemployment, poverty. Landlords, of course, are another matter. You're seeking an apartment? Call on our Miss Sashwaite of the (laughs) Blunt Instrument Department. (laughs) What a divine idea. If it suits your purpose, merely... But then we'd all be murdering each other. Oh, no. Oh, no. After all, murder is, or should be, an art. Not one of the seven lively, perhaps, but an art nevertheless. And as such, the privilege of committing it should be reserved for those few who are really superior individuals. And the victims, inferior beings whose lives are unimportant anyway. Obviously. Now, mind you, I don't hold with the extremists who feel that there should be open season for murder all year round. No. Personally, I would prefer to have cut a throat week (laughs) or uh, strangulation day. (laughs) And there's a little speech about it. And I'm watching this speech. I think I like I tweeted about it saying, like, this has to be what James DeMarco watched and thought of this movie. I don't buy the other story. Or maybe he just saw this movie and it seeped into his brain and it spat out as the Purge franchise. I don't know. But... Anyone out there should go watch Rope. Yeah, it's great. And it's it's streaming. I mean, you it's 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 out pretty much everywhere. Yeah, Rope. Yeah, and yeah, so that's just an aside as to kind of how the franchise goes. But so a couple other I mean, we talked I guess a lot about the first one, and I didn't really sketch out the plot of the second one that much, but we both kind of mentioned you both kind of mentioned it is that it it starts off when you see kind of like a working class woman at a cat, like a diner and her coworker. And, you know, she needs money essentially to pay for her father's prescription medicine that he needs again, immediately showing off the bat, like kind of the plight that you didn't get to see in the first movie of the actual people who are still suffering. So poverty might be at, or unemployment might be at 1%. Crime might be down, but people are still poor. People are still working hard to make a living. And I think that's an important piece because, it didn't eliminate crime. It just funneled more money up to rich people by all the things you said before, Don. Security, insurance, guns, TV commercials. I mean, God knows what they're showing. You know, they're probably like podcasters who have like purge podcasts. You know, <laughs> it's got the whole the whole thing. Purge you know, kill of the night. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like slow motion, instant replay. All and these then kind like of a sick leftist shit. version, which is like the, the missing purgers or something. That's about all the people that were lost during Purge Night that no one talks about, you know, from all sides, for sure. The the one thing that that got me about, and I have to now say, my mom, whenever I have, have her watch uh, horror films, I don't always tell her it's a horror film because her her <laughs> her mind goes straight to this is going to be stupid it's going to be you know the acting's going to be horrible whatever these are unbelievable situations this would never happen right i sit her down to watch something like the purge and she would say like yeah this shit could happen mm-hmm. <laughs> and i i'm saying this to say this i fully disagree with my mom i don't think the purge would happen the way it happens in the film because we would we, 
those in charge of the purge would monetize it to no end. Just the idea of, oh, it's going to be guns, security, this, this, this. You mean to tell me there's no one like uh, like in the in the first film, like Ethan Hunt's family. There's no one that's out there not, I'm watching the security cameras. Oh, I'm going to watch all the cameras in the neighborhood because I want to watch people die. Yes. I want to see this. You'd have streaming content. You'd have uh, Instagram influencers that were participating in The Purge. So they would do this stuff. I, I fully envision they would do stuff like, I really don't want to kill anybody, so I'm going to pay this guy to kill some. Kind of like the, the yes. George Bush crack thing. I, well, we couldn't find crack outside the White House, so let's we'll go find it somewhere else and say we found it right outside of the White House. I feel as there there would be so many people that would be, I mean, there would be TikTok trends about you know, uh, uh, you know, whatever your 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 yeah yeah whatever you, yeah oh, you'd have a purge challenge and it'd be like oh you gotta <laughs> you gotta find somebody with blue uh, shoelaces like I. I I like that they held back because I could there's no way Nike and Adidas are not sponsoring purge teams like it's Call of Duty. There's no way. And there's no way we wouldn't well, have like purge energy taxes as well. Like there would yeah. definitely be purge <laughs> taxes. Like in order to throw the purge, we need to have money behind it. There would be purge the elections would be purge centric. Like it's yeah, it's so true. You're so right. But no, I do think that Monster should have That's kind of unbelievable that like Monster energy drinks or something didn't team up with the purge to create purge juice. <laughs> Purge juice. Yeah, like a quadruple shot of Red Bull or something like bring back Surge Cola Absolutely. or whatever that was. Oh, you know what? I lied. I would participate in the Purge. This is what I would do. I'd put the cocaine back in Coca-Cola. There we go. <laughs> Just kidding. <laughs> well, the, the, this actually, this is unrelated to what you were just talking about, but it's another thing that I like couldn't help but think about. So one thing that's part of the Purge is there's no ambulance, there's no no uh, official channels for like people right. who are injured. And then so at the end of the purge, you know, the, 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 the healthcare system is obviously put to an absolute to the test. All the hospitals are going to have lines out the door in big cities and all these things. And I think about all the money that would then have to go to the hospitals to then fund the things that happened to the purge. Then you think about, then you start thinking about, well, all the money that they're going towards the purge, they could just like give everyone healthcare or yeah. I don't know, like not do this and do something else. <laughs> but it's just the same as everything where, you know, we don't have these things because corporations need tax breaks because, you know, they just do apparently or wh whatever. You know, it, it's just there's it, it gets more into the second film. And I like also how both films use TV and radio and just kind of things you kind of hear in the background to give you insight. Rarely do the characters really tell you about the purge except i guess in the second one you have kind of like the vigilante group the like the revolutionary group or what i don't know how you might call them that's against the purge and telling you know right. gen gen z on you know tiktok this this is bullshit like the, the purge is all to benefit the rich people so well yeah and and i think when it comes down to i don't know the the, the financial aspect of it as far as this idea of it it, it just indicates to you how much the government isn't going to, at least the, the U.S. government, isn't going to serve the people uh, or you know, even local governments, for that matter. Because if there's a football stadium that's going to be built, if we have half a billion dollars to put into education, after school programs, Head Start, all that stuff, there will be someone who say, what's the benefit? With a straight face, what is the benefit of having... Free lunches, free breakfast, free food program, all these things. Like, what is the benefit? Because they see the benefit only as what money, what profit is going to come out of that. And they will quickly sign a bond measure approving, you know, a stadium that the owner of the football team has a controlling interest in and gets the majority of the revenue for whatever takes place in that stadium. But then those same people say, well, the stadium added jobs. It didn't. It added like some temporary jobs, <laughs> you know for construction and things like that, but it didn't add anything that was going to sustain this. And then, the, yeah. you know, the owner can move the team whenever the hell he wants. I mean, in, in my own city of New York, I mean, just this past past 
budget cycle, they cut funding from the library. So now the library is not open on Sundays. What? They cut funding from education uh, and other things. And I'll can I, I bet you all can guess which agency did not see any budget cuts. I know it wasn't the it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't the NYPD. It starts with a P. <laughs> the police. Um, but I but I, it, I was just thinking about. I mean, it just it's you know. Um, I lost my train of thought. Oh, you, I mean, you were just saying is like, you know, people will say you don't need those programs. And I think it's because those people probably don't need those programs, right? It's easy to say these don't affect anyone if it doesn't affect you. Right. And I think what makes the second film also so effective is that showing, again, going back to the grandfather selling himself to be killed to a rich family so that he can provide $100,000 for his family, you know, those people are are getting are getting screwed because you know they have they still don't have high paying they you know they're working at a diner not getting paid well they have all these things and all the money that's being generated from the purge again is going to rich people like Ethan Hawke in the first movie because he sells a bunch of security systems to rich white people in a you know well mostly white people probably but you know at the point I guess is just you know the 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 both movies kept harping on in like some of the subtext of it's still ri- it's the money is being saved on social programs because you're killing all the poor right. people, but that money is just being funneled back into all the things that the purge generates. So really, yeah. they're not saving any money. Really, it's it's those tax cuts. It's those corporate tax cuts or the one percent tax cuts that come in where it's. It's like, hey, <laughs> we gave it. We get. We passed tax cut. You know, pack, tax cut package of. X year, um, and you see that 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 tax cut is substantially helping people that don't need it, or you have things like these um, vouchers uh, for schools where it's it's really just another tax break for wealthy people. Question that might be apropos of nothing, but while we're on the subject, there is a black family in like the HOA or development that Ethan Hawke's family lives in in the first one. And I might have missed this, but what was the deal with, I think the blonde lady, her name was Gretchen or something. What was the deal with her cookies? Because she brings by these cookies and then the black family rolls by and they're like, oh, Gretchen's cookies. And the wife sort of goes like, they're wonderful or something like that. And she obviously thinks the cookies suck. What was the deal with the, like, what was the deal with the cookies? I think they drugged them. They drugged the cookies. Okay. I don't know. I don't know. I, I don't know. I, that, I'm, I'm just uh, th- this because they never m- mentioned it again. It, it, I mean, I guess the only thing I could think of as like the the stupidest reason for what the point of it was. It was so that you could see that basically this family, like the Lena H- H- Henny and uh, um, I just said her name wrong. Uh, Lena Hetty. Yeah, I didn't say it right. Lena Hetty and Ethan Hawke's family. They don't seem to have any friends like no one in the neighborhood likes them. Because they're getting rich off of them, which I also thought was the reason for later going to kill them is because they built an addition on their house right. for making money selling security systems. It's not like the people in the what right. I don't understand why they're so angry about that. Like they probably sold the the purge insurance to other people, like you right. know, from whatever they're doing to live in a house that's equally as big. So I find that like maybe of all the like holes in the movie i don't really understand what their beef is it you see how trivial some of the 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 issues are that somebody needs to purge right it's oh you took this money from like like you fixated on this uh but yeah it, it's i could see somebody getting upset because i don't know somebody didn't say thank you or gazoon height or something like that I, I mean there are people that are that petty it's like oh you think you're better than me because you didn't I mean, well, there are people who have told me that I think I'm better than them because I was reading a book. One. Oh, no, that's I'm like, from what? Boston. Like, so what? that's like the motto is, oh, you think you're so smart. Like, yeah, no, for sure. <laughs> but also, I mean, that's it reminds me of Serial Mom in some ways where it's just like, oh, you didn't say thank you to the birds or you didn't do, you know, some sort of politeness or kindness or social order that they would have to belong to, which are really just, you know, sort of these manners that aren't really manners. It's more just social 
you know, it's social graces amongst the upper middle class or high class. And that is, um, that's exactly the kind of thing that would piss off someone in an HOA. You know, oh, I was, God. this just made me think of something that's ridiculous. Imagine just cause you're thinking about like, Oh, you didn't say God bless you. This, this idea came to my head of imagining if like the show Seinfeld like lived in the universe of like where the purge existed. And he's like, you know, they would argue over like something that happened and they're like going to kill them the next purge. I don't know. I don't know. Kramer would be I just think of George Costanza. Newman better watch or George Costanza would purge. <laughs> <laughs> maybe. Or no, maybe Kramer. Kramer actually. would he's definitely a, purge. Yeah. They couldn't stop him. I see Kramer's like just going in, in uh, you know, um, Picking the pockets of all the dead bodies that he comes across, <laughs> <laughs> looking for like a, a winning, you know, uh, a, a winning ticket from the from the track or something. Well, that's Actually, in- you know what I see Kramer's. Oh I'm sorry. no, it- I, I see Kramer's walking through and like no, you know, he's walking through all this violence and nothing happens. He's just looking around like. <laughs> yeah unscathed but that said like to your point though about like kramer going and picking pockets in the second movie when we see that they get sold off by a group of people who are like we don't need to kill you we just need money like for so many people right. the purge could be a come up for them like this could be the thing that gets them through their financial year or the thing that makes it you know not so you know, people aren't scrounging for groceries or whatever is that they have this extra purge mm-hmm. money and that is an area where the lower class could actually make a killing off the purge, so to speak. Yeah. It's, I guess you could call them class traders in a sense, right? They're selling out their fellow, you know, community for, for money. And I mean, you like, you can't, I don't want to like blame them because they're in the situation where like they have, it's no different than like, you know, going towards, you know, some kind of uh, crime because you needed to pay your bills or whatever it is. That's what this group has gone towards. And then it also made me think about in the, uh, the, the second movie. Wow. You were just saying about the, the selling off. What was it? Oh, and there's also like the people at one point when one of the, the main character, like the waitress is walking home from, I'm blanking on her name at the moment, is walking home from work. There's some people like in the street trying to sell her guns, you know, just on the street being like, this is just part of, you know, society now, you know, rather than have the guns be, you know, kind of hidden. You're just now just, oh, yeah, I can just walk down the street and buy a Smith and Wesson. Oh, That's it's like either. concert. Well, not t-shirt. only that. Concert yeah. t-shirts. <laughs> Purge shirts. No, you get the the the, the gun gun, kind of mm-hmm. like the t-shirt gun where it's like, boom, nine millimeter, boom. Uh, but no, like you, you bring up a good point about when she is going, you know, walking home. And you have the solicitors that are like, hey, you know, you can't just bust people in the face. You got to you got to use the Smith and Wesson. You got to use this. You got to we got Uzis. We got this. And so when he's having that conversation with her as she's walking away, it's like, hey, I take all kinds of payment. And you're sitting there like, oh, my God, think about all the people. I mean, there's already the exploitation. But then you're talking to a woman, a woman of color. Dawn. A, a working woman of color who is already probably way scared and anxious about the night and you're offering, well, you can pay me in sex to protect yourself. And just the way that one little thing gets thrown in, you're sitting there like, holy sh-. I mean, you've got gender, but then you also have race, age, class that's thrown into it as far as the insecurity of, of, of her own personal space as well as her, her live space. It was remarkable how they were able to throw that in as kind of a a real subtle jab at everything. And it's interesting because the, then you get their super, I guess it's the super in the building, who's like yeah. hitting on her when she walks in the building. And he's now slighted by all the times that she's like rejected him. I say that in quotes because, you know, it's – well, he's a nice it just, guy. His perception. He's yeah, he's a, a nice guy. guy. That's the nice guy who's using his right to purge and, you know, he insinuates, you know, it's going to be a good night. So obviously we can read the subtext there. But another thing I actually was going to mention as part of the movies in general, we were talking about, you know, the things within it and, you know, how the, you know, analyzing some of the movie and everything. But then I think about with a lot of movies that I've done that are very on the nose as far as what the critique is. I think there is a subset of people who will watch these movies, who do watch these movies, 
and take the complete opposite where they're like, I'm going to go fucking perched and, you know, I wish we could do this. And I, I think that the, the people that are portrayed in the movie as the actual purgers in the first one are very wealthy people. In the second movie, it's kind of a mix because you have, you're on the street. You don't know what people's situation is. They could just be people out to kill. They're getting revenge on a neighboring gang. There's no real, it's, the title is appropriately anarchy. It is literally, literally anarchy out there. And so you don't really have any sense of what's happening. And uh, then you learn also later in the movie that these fancy trucks that are going around are armed because not enough people are killing anymore. And so they have to like, essentially the government is now funding with your purge taxes, I guess that you're one of you said the purge taxes <laughs> is now going back in to then kill you. Like they're literally funding militias to kill people, which isn't un unlike, you know, southern United States in the early 20th century with, you know, we can, you know, so I don't know. It's uh, it is anarchy in that second movie. But oh, yeah. at the end of oh, the day, the definitely. government is participating. But which is we well, which is interesting because that group. They still abide by the rules at the they end do. because when that horn goes off, when the alarm blares, you know, they mean you're like, all right, let's go home. And I'm like, OK, <laughs> at least we get that ending where it's you see what happens at the end. I mean, it, of course, at this point, there's only the two films. Um, yeah. But at the end of the second one where you see how people honestly treat it as eh, time's up. Let's go home. <laughs> the last five minutes, there's a point though in the second one where like, there's like, there's five minutes left in the purge and, you know, the sergeant goes inside the house to get his revenge on the person who had murdered his son, which I also thought was a nice touch that you learn later that it wasn't because of the purge. It was actually a drunk right. driving incident. And then he has a change of heart. He decides to let the man live. And then because of doing this, that person then saves him. So there's lots of moments in both movies where the person coming to the realization of this might be, I'm not this person and then getting saved mm -hmm. by, you know, someone else that, that could have been purred. So I, I think right. both movies have, I don't know if I want to say the first movie has a satisfying ending. I guess it does. It's, it's still a good movie, but the second one I think has even more of that kind of somewhat satisfying ending where you feel good about the people at the end of the movie. Oh, most definitely. You know, I want to just really quickly like go back to the conversation around the mom in the first movie who was being sexually harassed by her landlord, which is a frightening situation to begin with. But I can't help but think about how much watching The Purge, you know, I think some of our most dangerous people in day to day life, but especially during something like The Purge would be incels. Because they're so cowardly. And I can't help but think that the greatest crime, the thing that would happen by the most numbers, would be rape or assault on women, children, disabled people, the elderly, um, just cheap shots. You know what I mean? And that is the one of the things that when I think about, oh, gosh, well, what if I was in the purge? That's one of the areas where I feel the most vulnerable because... I mean, there are people, there are men that want to attack you just because you refuse to date any any day of the week. But during the purge, right, this is this right. fantastic opportunity to take revenge. And, you know, it is scary um, how I would say in particularly, I, and I, I realize this is coming from a person who said that if I had to purge during a certain time in my life, I would have killed an ex-boyfriend. Um but I, you know, in, in particular, like, um, yeah, re rejected men have a very difficult time on a day to day basis, let alone if they were given a day like this, how much that would be their crime of choice. Th those are the things that they probably, you know, they're fantasizing or internalizing all the things that they believe are slights to them or that they're being oppressed. You think of like, you know, the groups of like white men are the most oppressed people. Uh, you, you will 100% would get incels. You'd mm -hmm. get very conservative groups. Like they only describe major cities really for the most part. Sometimes like the news pieces like, Oh, in Albuquerque or whatever cities, like these were the most purging happened. Texas, I think they mentioned is the number one place, but you don't also even get a sense of like, what would happen in more like rural towns where there really isn't, 
the same kind of protection that you would even have from right. people in your community. So I think you'd see a lot of these awful crimes like that, that just people would just have free reign to do that. They probably would do if they could. Business right idea for Andrew Tate. I mean, if he wanted to, he <laughs> oh, could do a one month excursion in the States that starts three weeks before the purge. So these guys could walk around getting rejected, collecting enemies, have their week during the purge. You know, I mean, like you could bring anyone from around the world. That's one thing, too, is that like <laughs> the amount of uh, people that could travel to America to participate in the purge is well, that happens in the third movie, right? There's yeah. like tourist Oh, is mergers. that right? Okay, pardon yeah. me. I I, I yeah. did watch that one more no, recently no, no. than the others, but yeah. You probably had that in your subconscious. Yeah, I, think. I think so. The Purge lives within me. Yeah, I think one of the first... Because I, I've watched them all pretty recently. The third one at the beginning, I think, they show some tourists from like Germany or mm -hmm. somewhere in Europe at an airport getting off being like, we're here to purge. And so it becomes this like tourist attraction and it's almost funny to me, like we're not talking about the third one that much, but that's hilarious to me because most non-Americans and Europeans view America's like gun problem as <laughs> just like laughable. Like how are they having all these problems with guns? And then they come to America to participate in the violence. Like it's right. that's on the, like everything is so on the nose that it's almost impossible to just to comprehend. Like I, that's why I don't think how you, how you could watch this movie and not, see it at least generally in this perspective but you know i someone i knew got mad at me when i ruined robocop and told him it was the kind of movie it was so you know who knows <laughs> robocop being like maybe the most on the nose action movie ever made yeah which anyway. i mean not 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 to you know sidetrack but um yeah that I, that's that was my problem when people complained about the second one people i who were purist about the first saying that there should have never been a remake i'm like did you did you not see robocop 3 because it kind of messed some stuff up um but the the way in which they talk about the how the military industrial complex is tied in to police departments and sheriff's departments but it's also um basically exporting the stuff that they want to use as part of the military industrial complex, but they're using it to oppress people abroad. And then it becomes an issue of like, Hey, this worked really well in war. Let's try and take the same technology and use it for, I don't know, Detroit. <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. I, I could, I, I've done RoboCop on the show as one of my, it's one of my favorite movies of all time. So I could, we could be sidetracked for a long time, but, uh, <laughs> but um, I don't know. Uh, I can't think of any other – I mean, we've basically gone through – I mean, we've, we've quote-unquote spoiled all the movies for everyone. We, we kind of get the redemption arc, I think, a little bit in both. Mm -hmm. But the, the one thing I will say is I don't know that I – so Ethan Hawke dies in the first one at the very end. Right. And if he didn't die, I don't think the movie is has a good enough ending to me. I think him dying, like, need to needed to happen yes. because – even he didn't really, even though he like made kind of was like pushed into making the right decision. I don't think he really wanted to make the no. decision he made at all. And so, and, and, and like his daughter at one point, like right after he's tying up the, the guy in the house, he's like, Oh, it'll all be fine. She's like, no, it can never be fine or it will never go back yeah. to the way it was. And I think that the, this family has an awakening where the rest of the family that survives realizes, you know, they could have all this money and they can live behind these walls. But I think it's also just kind of shows the uh, susceptibility of these. The feeling of security is is kind right. of, of uh, a fabrication in some sense. You can put iron bars on your door, but you're not safe. Well, you brought up something and, and it was, you know, as far as talking about the, the gun culture and things like that. Um, maybe it's me. I don't know. I, I, I might project. I don't know. <laughs> but maybe it's me. But did either of you get the sense that the uh, I mean, she's billed as the old, elegant woman um, when she's describing the weapon and describing the suggestion? She says, I personally think that you should go with the Mauser Elite SXX double barrel. It, it seemed very sexual. She to was her. so moved by it. I know. I yeah. agree with you. She was so moved by it. You would almost think she had a personal 
interest in it. I mean, I definitely implied experience with it, but it also felt like she had a deeper personal interest in this weapon, almost as if she or her family had crafted it themselves. And this was some sort of legacy weapon that was being handed down. By the way, I want to say your thing about the machete. I always thought machetes were very sharp. So that was very interesting to learn that they're more of a hacking weapon. Oh, no, they're still sharp. It's just, it's it's a hacking tool. It's not, you know, I mean, it's hack and slice, but it's not a precision tool of like, if you need to stab somebody, with, it's not a good tool. Not that I have experience, but just. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's just because the, 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 the amount of the blade versus how big the handle is and the positioning of it, it's, it's not made for doing much damage if you're stabbing so if you're trying to kill somebody it's it's hack and slice well i hope it wasn't too painful for the grandfather <laughs> Wait, that's the yeah, i have a feeling they, they just kind of <laughs> leave that there right they just kind of leave that there and like i'm thinking like I, it's funny as i was watching them like i hope there was like a really bulletproof contract to like they're actually gonna get paid on this if they can survive the you know this purge but they're they're like it's interesting because the end of the movie you just kind of it just doesn't it just kind of ends right you you he redeems himself and then they're driving off you wonder the only character that really recurs heavily is the sergeant he's in you know the first you know i guess it's not in the first movie but he's in the second movie the third movie um you you i like that they the franchise using some through characters, but kind of leaving people behind in a sense where they don't get, you don't get to see their story. Um, just generally, cause I like movies where there isn't like a, you know, Hollywood ending in quotes. I mean, there is good endings, but it's still the fucking purge. You know, the purge didn't end in these movies. You still have it. So like you're thinking, well, this violence is going to carry on the following year, regardless of what happened this night. Like they're safe now. But they could be not safe in 364 days. So I don't know. Did you guys know that the couple in the second movie, Keely Sanchez and Zach Guilford, um, he's from my favorite show, um, Friday Night Lights, which I loved. Um, did you know they were yes. married in real life? I did not know that. Yeah. Isn't that That's interesting? interesting. I love Friday Night Lights too. Matt Saracen. Yeah. Yeah. They were, um, they're married in real life and, um, I thought that was I thought that added an interesting element as well to see them on the brink of their marriage, you know, not them as act or people, but their couple being, you know, um, you know, it just must have been I don't know, it must have been exciting for them. Well, he like the like the Shane character like has that mild redemption scene when they're in like the tunnel of the subway and this thing is rolling down, shooting down at them and he just, you know, these people have never shot guns before and they're just taking people out. Yeah. I mean, gotta, gotta respect them for that. Like with the exception of like the Sergeant and then some of the characters in the third movie, none of these people like have experience with guns. Like that's the other thing about all of this too is people are like using guns on a day just to kill people with no, most of them have no training. Oh, you no. know, it's, <laughs> yeah. These people who don't know what they're doing. Keely's character said at one point, something to the extent of are you just handing us guns which <laughs> yeah. i think on any night but purge night would have made more sense like if someone now handed me a gun i would be completely appalled on purge night i think that i would have enough false confidence to be like okay <laughs> fine if you're giving me this thing <laughs> i guess maybe we're okay in this alley um but yeah gosh God, there's like booby traps in the in the alley too that they set so that like the guy his leg gets snapped like right. it's like it is crazy the like yeah like we're just I keep going back to like the idea of all the technology and things that there people are buying like booby traps and these crazy things that you would never think to use in a, like a civilian setting this is like military grade equipment that's now just like thrust into like the middle of downtown LA or whatever city you know it's 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 just wild. Well, it's a, it's a, it's really a wild movie. I think in some of the ways that women like true crime, that might be some of the ways that I'm sort of <laughs> comforted by this movie in a weird, sick way where I'm like, oh, yeah, anywhere I walk could be dangerous. Like, that's good to know. There could be a booby trap on the other side of the sidewalk. Like the confidence with which he walks out there and then to watch it all get taken away from him in such a 
scary moment was um it's I felt like, OK, I'm taking notes like don't walk out onto the sidewalk without looking down first, you know? Yeah. And who's cleaning up all those booby traps like the day like after they go <laughs> up there and like sweeping it up? They have like the purge cleanup crew because like, their bodies all over. You know, I mean, it's these are just stupid questions that like, you know, no, there that, actually think- is a is a purge, I, I guess, day after purge, like cleaning things. Is that in the alternate side movie? parking? I, they yeah they 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 oh, allude okay. to it in the okay in the I, fifth I gotta movie. watch the fifth one. I'm watching it as soon as we get off of this. I'm not even kidding. Like, oh look, all day tomorrow I'm gonna watch the third, fourth. <laughs> I'm gonna I, write yeah, my I, fan I, fiction. So I watched the one, two, three, and then I rewatched one and two yesterday and today. Not both days, like one yesterday, mm-hmm. one today. But I really want to see now. I uh, watched the first purge, but I feel like I was only partly paying attention because I was thinking to my head like okay we're going to be talking about those but that seems very important in the lore of kind of what because it's called the first purge so it clearly is to taking us back to when it became a thing and so it's so that's like the one to watch and as much as I love all of these movies I did get to the first purge last and I'm kind of glad that I did seeing the way that the series played out because the you know the third and f- a fourth were my first ones no the second one i was brought to a little don a little like the way that you so like to surprise your mom which by the way is a little mean i'm just going to be honest but god bless no, you no 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 <laughs> she 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 watches it she she loves it but if you tell her it's horror she immediately like uh, mm, everything and this is unbelievable to me yes. i don't like it no i i get it it's I, not that she's scared of anything it's just kind of like it it it's it's like I don't know trying to convince somebody to eat something that it they would normally eat, but you just called it a different name. I t- I completely get it. No, so two things. One, I wound up seeing the first purge because my best friend invited me to go see a movie, and we both you know we work, we don't have time to hang out the way we did in our early twenties, and so when I was invited. I was like, yeah, I'll go. I don't care what this thing is. You know, I just want to see my bestie. And, you know, then I was introduced. We were just both horrified. And now it's become our sort of tradition to go see horror movies together. But that was my first introduction to The Purge. And at the time, I was dating someone who knew Keely and Zach. And I thought that was very... I was like, but they're playing a divorce couple in this movie. Like, are they okay? <laughs> um, I took it very seriously. Um, but yeah, I um, I got kind of sort of tr- like tricked, not really into seeing the first, second purge. And so that's where I started. And then I think I saw election year I saw and then the f- the first purge I saw. And that was the day that I was walking around the mall smiling like an idiot, unable to think about anything <laughs> else. It was like a, it was like an amazing first date, you know, when you're just walking around in a haze being like, wow, what if the rest of my life is this? You know, um, it was really the purge was like it just the fourth purge was really fantastic. So um yeah, by the time I made it back to the first to see where it all started, I was a little underwhelmed because it just sort of really picks up from there. Um, but secondly, I will say with Blumhouse, one time I did have a meeting there and I knew it was like sort of I don't like to do a ton of research before I go in somewhere because I one, I feel like it's creepy and two, I feel overprepared and that's not really where I'm at my best. And so I went in knowing that it was like a place that did horror movies, that they had done a lot of specialty horror movies. I believe this was right after Get Out had come out and I think they did Get Out as well. And he's done this other movie called The Neighbors. Have you ever seen that movie where it's like Liv Tyler and they they live out in the woods? Oh, the Strangers. The Strangers, yes. Strangers. And I got up off the couch after my meeting and I turned around and I realized because I hadn't really registered the artwork that was above the couch I was sitting on. I was just thinking of going to sit down and do my meeting. And when I stood up, he had all the masks from that movie on his wall and I literally yelped I was like why would you have this here like I was terrified it was really it's really scary to see those things in real life and like that's why I also think the purge is so genius is because for each one they sort of invent these 
really haunting yes. masks that are set, like the first movie, the masks are maybe one of the scariest parts of the film is because like, yeah, you're getting Manson girl behavior and there's a sort of overall um, evilness to everyone. But the masks themselves, I think, are kind of really brilliant in terms of costuming and props. I can't speak to the the later ones, but I also find masks unnerving more than like maybe they should be but i think it's because like with any like monster or horror movies it's like it's hiding the horror that you don't like really know Mm -hmm. so in some way like you you see them coming in and then he takes in the first movie he takes he kind of lifts it off and he's like oh he's just this like punk rich kid or whatever right like he kind of like loses his (laughs) he is zach morris yes (laughs) <laughs> oh, if Zach Morris went and uh, did some purging. Um, but I, I, it's funny. I, I haven't seen The Strange. Is that, that I want to add that to my list. It's, I know oh, the gosh, guy I, did, uh, that guy did The Dark and the Wicked, which is a really scary movie. It, the the okay. Strangers I watched in the middle of the clear blue day by myself, my friend had recommend my same friend who tricked me to see The Purge, um, had recommended it to me and said, like, this is a really scary movie, but you should watch it. You have to watch it. And I have I was it shaking in my boots and it must have only been 2 p.m. by the time I was done. I was so it's so scary. <laughs> I almost wouldn't yeah. recommend it to a friend. But if you if you have the um, stomach for it, I would say go for it. But it's yeah, it was really I found it to be pretty like nine out of ten, at least scary. I saw it once. I saw it at the movie theater and I was like, I don't need to watch that movie again <laughs> because oh, it was, this... it was too, it, it made you so paranoid mm-hmm. because again, you never see who the people are. And that's, that's the power of the mask is the person behind that mask has their anonymity until they take the mask off. They know who you are. Yes. And that's, that's even the, the even more scarier thing is they know who you are one by 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 your appearance but then also they may have some connection to you so you your mind is just struggling to figure it out i the the two of you're going to like the fifth one because they they continue on with uh Oof. masks and coverings in that and the ones that they have for this are very creepy yeah the okay. new one very is creepy. um available on prime i think uh you have to watch commercials but that's okay with me um, can I ask you guys one more question? But what just like an open ended? So the guy that they cast, the sort of Zach Morrissey guy that they cast in the first movie, he had to have been like the casting description must have looked something like you need to have an amazing smile. It reminded me of another movie that I can't put my finger on at the moment with the smile. It's another horror movie that I feel like I've seen sometime recently where the smile just like gets you. Like it's very creepy. His mouth just, it's almost like he's still wearing the mask, like the, the yes. lips and this just keeps going. Yeah. It was very unsettling. Mm, great films. Yeah. I don't know. Do either of you have any last, any last uh, thoughts? I've, I've- I've got none other than I could just imagine the the purge becoming a television show, not the you know within our world. I mean, within their world, where's the purge television show? Kind of like Running Man, because the the second film is if you've ever seen Running Man, it's a it's a if you haven't seen, it, I should say, it is a great um, criticism of I mean, nineteen eighties excess uh, exploitation politics um and entertainment for that matter but i mean you could you could easily remake the movie shot for shot and you'd get the same message i mean you you I mean just cgi arnold don't don't even have to recast him <laughs> i i did that movie on this podcast and for people who don't know it was actually based on a book by stephen king mm-hmm. who he wrote it under a pseudonym and the book is completely different for anyone who's interested it's it's but yeah running man is a a solid one yeah i mean anyone out there who you know even though we've ruined all the 
well, the first couple of Purge movies. We didn't. I think no. that despite no, there's so no, 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 much. We, don't we, ever we, think that because we there's so no. much action in each. Oh, there's spoiled, a lot. Spoiled, spoiled. I should say spoiled, not ruined. I didn't. I didn't mean like we've ruined the movies. Now no one would want to watch them. I mean that we have now given you what's happened. But I think you'd still would be satisfied in watching them. I think across the board here, all of us, Don and Molly, both would give these these two films. Or at least just watching The Purge, all all five stars, it seems mm-hmm. like. Yeah, it surprised every all the main characters live, <laughs> um, except for Ethan Hawke. Um, but I guess I would say, uh, if I have anything to say as a final note, I hope everyone goes and votes. Um, <laughs> it's like, <Yeah. laughs> I don't think we're actually very far away from a reality in which something like this could happen which is sort of why I started off by saying it's so crazy how not far into the future this was um, and that this could already be seen as a potential reality. I really, really hope that where we're at right now with, you know, uh, on the night of us recording this up, and I hope I'm not like taking anything away from by the time this airs, but like Trump just won in New Hampshire, you know, like it is very scary how close we could be to a world like this. And um, I just Mm -hmm. really hope everyone goes and exercises their vote and votes for the elderly man, even if you don't want to do that, the right elderly man. And like, that's, and that's, um, that's what I have to say. (laughs) Oh, no, I was gonna say what, what, what I would add to that is if you don't believe the purge is possible, um, just go read Agen- uh, Agenda 47 and the 2025, whatever oh, Nazi Project manifest. Pro- yeah, whatever Nazi yeah, manifesto that they have out there. Because yeah, that, they're talking that, about that getting crazy. rid of... It, it, it's it's damn near plagiarizing the plan that the, the individuals in Germany from the 1930s to the 1940s... <laughs> um, I've never heard them call the individuals my... in Germany. Well, no, I started thinking, I was like, where, where's Evan Host in this? Because if this, you know, anyway, the, 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 the Nazi party, what they started pushing, which was, hey, disabled people, we, we need to get rid of you. It costs too much money to maintain you. People with, with uh, mental issues, we got to get rid of you because it costs too much money. And then what people like Reagan did, what people like Reagan did is, you know, they they un- cut funding and and eliminated so many programs that were helping people and then complained about people being unhoused or having to, to deal with addiction. And it's anything for a buck. May Reagan rot in hell. But then again, hell is too nice of a place. Mm. <laughs> I, I'm going to randomly add, just because you mentioned The Running Man, this is completely – maybe I can just cut this later. I'm just going to tell you both anyway. There's actually a Korean – game show called the run called running man and it's not quite exactly that but it does have like probably people don't die i would assume right. but it's like it's like a reality show where the people have like missions running around outside that's like loosely based on the concept of the running man oh i'll have I to go have to watch that. that oh is that on is that on there's netflix si- no, it's it looks like it's only on like a Korean channel and there are six hundred and eighty eight episodes to catch up on. Oh thank oh. God <laughs> <laughs> See, that's the problem when I when I start getting into a show, I'm like, or start thinking about getting into a show and somebody recommends it. I'm like, how many episodes are they? And my fear is if they give me a low number, it's, oh, crap, it got canceled and it's going to leave an open end. I don't like that. Or it's a hell of a lot of episodes. But like, I don't have time for one piece. I don't. I <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I like I like modern shows now where they have, you know, three seasons, 20 episodes or, you know, 10 episodes a season and boom, you're done. But yeah, I would um, I I will get lost to the world for a week and come out the other side very sweaty and saying, I love this Korean show. You have to I'll ruin parties. I won't be able to go about a party. Um, Yeah, but thank you, Evan, for having me on. I appreciate it. Yeah, it was awesome to meet you. you. Great man, yes, as well. Don, uh, Don, and I'm going to say your name correctly, Gilroy. Uh, I said it wrong again, didn't I? I, <laughs> I was like, again. I was like <laughs> and, and, and then, and then I, so at first I was going to say it as a joke, and then I said it That's in a more I serious I was like, I was like, really? <laughs> <laughs> no, but but thank you, uh, Molly uh, McAleer and uh, uh, Donald Gillery, thank for you. joining me to talk about the purge. It's been great.
And uh, I think you, did you, I know Molly, you have some podcasts you, if you want to tell people. And I think Don, you also have stuff you both want to oh, yeah, yeah. briefly share what you're doing. If you so choose, you don't have to. Sure. So most people, I think this would be the most broadly appealing. I have a show called trend lightly where we cover sort of niche trending news that you may not have heard of from that week. And it's a really fun show. My co-host is amazing. And we bring a wide range of different niche subjects that we were tracking throughout the week and explain them to you. So if you are extremely online, there's a place for you there. And if you're not extremely online, we'll catch you up so you know what you're talking about when you speak to someone from Gen Z at a party. And I also have, uh, this is a little bit more niche, but I have a long form Lifetime original movie slash we've started taking in Law and Order SVU episodes because they are very similar in a lot of ways. And that is about six years running. There's nearly 300 episodes. So if you want to go check that out, Evan's been a guest and has been fantastic. And Don, I would really love to have you on sometime if you'd ever. Oh, I was about to ask him, like, when can I come on? Uh, You can come on. Literally, (laughs) I'll book you in March. I'd love to have you. you. Look, you want to talk about niche type stuff. I mean, I have (laughs) there. There are so many fandoms that. Oh, let me take a piece of this. Let me just have something of mine. I love your brain. <laughs> yeah. I really do. This brief exposure no, to you. you has been really a treat. Thank you. Thank you. I've enjoyed the conversation. It's, um, oh, I guess I should. Um, podcast that I co-host with uh, with James Sabata is the Necronami.com. Uh, we do social commentary on horror films. And, you know, Molly, you already mentioned horror. So we might have to get you on before we take our break i guess because we'll be celebrating our fifth anniversary and then we're just kind of got gonna do something that's like a i guess a monthly or special event stuff like but not special event uh, <laughs> no i know <laughs> like, treat rele- your events like they're like, special no i mean like you know uh there's a release that happens of a certain movie and a friend or somebody who's been on the show wants to talk about it then we'll come back but uh that's the plan now because the original plan was we were gonna kill off the show like a year and a half and <laughs> uh, other than that I've got some books uh, they're available pretty much everywhere um, if you go to Amazon and you see the ISBN number just copy the ISBN number and go to your local pop uh, mom and pop uh, bookstore go to your independent bookstore and order it I own the ISBN numbers so can't uh, they being Amazon can't do anything so <laughs> <laughs> uh, other than that you know I'm I, I do do it all. Well, I'll put notes to both or links to both, uh, both all that stuff in the uh, the show. You can get your books and podcasts galore. But uh, it's been great uh, talking to you both, and um, you can subscribe to this podcast wherever you're listening right now. You can just hit the subscribe button, and you'll be able to listen to future episodes of Left the Projector. And we'll catch you next time. <laughs>